morning to the Sabbath school. Amen. It is now 11 o'clock and we want to get ready to start our next session. Thank God for our youth that came on at, and our teachers that came on around um, 9.45 until, well, yeah, 9.45 and until 10.45. And we thank God for that session. We, we praise God for blessing us to come together once again. Why? Because we are members of the Sabbath school every Sabbath morning. This is the way we learn God's word and all of his commandments. Amen. We praise God for blessing us throughout the week and allowing us to come together. Again. And for that, we thank him. Amen. We think about this virus and the 500,000 people who are dead. And we don't want to be desensitized to the trauma and all the hurt that is going on. But we want to be grateful unto God that he's allowed us to live, that he's allowed us to come together once again. And not only do we come together, but as we do, he is teaching us about him. And I don't know about you, my, my knowledge has been increased and I thank God for what he's doing Thank God for how he's touching our pastor and giving him nuggets to, to impart and, and helping us to understand God's word. Thank God for how he's blessing Deacon Preston. We praise God for all that he's doing, and we don't want to take it for granted. Uh, we are so blessed. So that being said, I want to get out of the way and turn this part of the service over to our Deacon Preston and our Pastor James Rack. Amen, Saints. I always want to just say happy Sabbath, and I want to thank you for taking the time to engage with us on, on the Sabbath day. You have an opportunity to be other places, but when you take the time to engage with us, I personally want to extend a word of thanks and gratitude for you doing that. Hopefully, as we bring forth these Sabbath school lessons, they are enriching your life, changing your life, and allowing you to have a closer walk with Jesus Christ. But before I jump into what I typically do for our Sabbath school, I always want to give our Apostle Ragland the opportunity to welcome you to Sabbath school and to hear his voice and his word. So, Apostle, I'm going to put it in your hands right now. God bless you. Good morning, Big and Preston. Thank you. Good morning, Sabbath school. We thank God and honor God for our superintendent, our sister Charmaine White, for our teachers and the youth classes, our sister Darlene and our Deacon Rodney, uh, who always do a, they all they both do a great job with those um, classes that they have for everyone that's coming on. We thank God for the opportunity. Great lesson today is covers one of my, one of the, I'm going to say a pet peeve, but one of my subjects that I'm always concerned about in dealing with the saints. Um, when we get to prophecies and things of that nature, it is it is something to be understood. So hopefully, and I know, prayerfully, and I know we will, today we'll cover those aspects that the saints need to be uh, aware of and even warned of. So God bless you, Deacon Preston. Amen. So thank you for that, Apostle. And so saints, what I want to do is we jump into our Sabbath school lesson. I'm always mindful of the fact uh, I always like to just share this with the saints of God as you come to our Sabbath school. I want to welcome you. So I want to welcome you to the house of God. We are a Christ-centered, Bible-based church that endeavors to teach the truths of God and have a positive impact on our community by demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. And so the foundation of what we teach here at the House of God is based on love. Uh, and so everything comes from that, that belief that it is through the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God. And I always like to define that, is that the love of God God's love is his holy disposition towards all that he's created that compels him to express unconditional affection and selective correction to provide the highest and best quality of existence both now and forever for the objects of his love. And so, again, I said last week, I want to thank you for your continued engagement. I noticed last night when we had Bible study, um, the numbers continue to go up. I thank God for Apostle Raglan and his, his teaching last night that was, was eye-opening and gave some additional clarity on grace. But I want to thank you for your engagement. But I do have an ask, and I said this last week, in 2021, bring one. And so what I would ask you to do is, 
when you bring your one, let us know, let me, let Apostle Raglan know, let Sister Brenda know, because we want to recognize you when you bring that one. So here's the thing, when we think about the blessing of the pandemic, and I know that sometimes that can be an oxymoron, is that blessing in a pandemic. But my thing is, if we've taken the opportunity in this time of solitude in disconnection, and we're not designed to be disconnected, but maybe it's an opportunity be, to be uh, to steal away, to get in our secret closet, to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with the Almighty. So maybe this is an opportunity for us to continue to grow and grow closer to God. So my ask, and, and I know Apostle, you support this, is just in 2021, bring one. And that's going to be one of the things that we want to ask. Now, remember, as we think about the lesson today, speak my word faithfully. I always want to go through the three question framework as you as you read your Bible uh, after Sabbath school, after Bible study, during Bible study, is that what does it say? So what is the observation that I have as I look as I read God's word? And we did a Bible study where we talked about reading the word out loud and just making sure you read it quietly and reading it aloud again so you can hear what, what God's word is saying. And then what does it mean? So what is that interpretation that the word has? And then what does it mean to me? And I wanted to, to share this. I shared this with my children this week as I think about where we are in the pandemic and, and really what the enemy can potentially do if we allow him to do. And I saw this this week as I was studying and, I, and I just, it just really resonated with me. And it says the greatest spiritual danger we face is not suddenly springing away from God, but allowing our heart to slowly drift from his presence. That's right. And so what I would ask us to do today as we dig into this word is that I would ask you to just do a sober self-assessment. Where are you with God today? Has your relationship slipped away? Are there some things that during the pandemic that you, you're, you picked up some habits, you picked up some ways, and you, you know that they're not pleasing to God? Uh, and so the thing is, it's not going to be a sudden pulling away. It's going to be a slow drifting. And so if you've drifted, we encourage you to continue to engage with us because God is drawing us nigh and we want to draw closer to him. And so that's why we have God's word. Amen. So when we think about this lesson today, speak my word faithfully. I'm going to really focus on some things. I'm going to focus on what is a false prophet, because I think it's really important to understand what a false prophet is. And then we're going to talk about a true prophet. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Jeremiah uh, when you think about Jeremiah's life of prophesying, he wasn't the most popular person in his nation. And so we're going to spend time talking about the false prophet, the danger of the false prophet and false prophecies. And Apostle said that earlier. That's probably one of his pet peeves. So we know he will have some things to say there. And then we're going to talk about the, the true prophet. And we're really going to think about in this day and age, people have itching ears. Why don't people want to hear the word of God? And be obedient to the word of God. A lot of times in the church world today, people have it, uh, I want to have it my way. And that's not the way it is. And while I love Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. I've got to do it God's way because God's way is the only way. And so I want us to be mindful of that as we study this lesson. So our Sabbath school writer had three main points. Beware of false prophets who use theatrical sermons to touch emotions and exhort money for filthy lucre. Each individual must study the word of God for themselves and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the word of God instructs us to turn from our evil ways and from our evil doings. So, Apostle, before I jump into scripture, I'm going to jump to two scriptures. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about your thoughts on these false prophets before we jump into the word. Apostle. Well, dear Professor, you know, but I just want the saints to be very aware of false prophets so many, and it's covered in the lesson, so I'm going to get too far ahead, but so many times people look at false prophets by what they said did not come true. False prophets will tell the truth. Mm. We'll talk about that a little later. Understand, a false prophet is not always the message, is that who he is and who she, uh, who she he or she supports and what is their intent. I just want you to know, touch on that. And uh, we, I don't want to say too much ahead of you. So we'll, we, I'm right there with you. All right. So here's, here's what we're going to do. 
Uh, and I, I thank Sister Joan. She shared in the IM uh, or the chat your strategy on how to study the Bible really helped me. Thank you. Love to hear that. And hopefully uh, we will continue to enhance our teaching so we can be better for you and, and strengthen the body of Christ. So if you've got your Sabbath school book, we're on lesson 21, February 27, 2021. And it's on page 67. The title of our lesson today is Speak My Word Faithfully. There are a multitude of voices today who claim to speak the word of God. The title prophet or prophetess is utilized widely. Many use verses and partial verses from the Bible in theatrical sermons to touch emotions and exhort money for filthy lucre. Others fail to condemn sin and unrighteousness and overlook things that contradict the word of God. Common prophecies heard today are for non-specific blessings for the congregation or individuals. People often gather in great numbers to hear a word from the Lord, from alleged prophets. Some replace a relationship with Christ and dedicated study of his written word with hearing from a prophet. The biblical examples of prophets are different from prophets seen today. They were frequently called to speak boldly about specific judgments that God was going to bring for sin. Memory verse Jeremiah 23, 28, the prophet that hath the dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Biblical application. Jeremiah prophesied of the future judgment of God from sin. He proclaimed in a popular message to rebellious people. He said that the whole land would be a desolation and an astonishment and that nations would serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. False prophets came with contradictory messages. They claimed to be from the word of the Lord. Some thought that they could resist or fight the coming judgment. King Zedekiah sent for sure and Zephaniah to get Jeremiah to inquire of the Lord. The word of the Lord to Jeremiah was that the way of life was, was to go out and fall to the siege of the Chaldeans. This meant submitting to the plan of God. This was contrary to message of the false prophets and not what people wanted to hear. Many today have itching ears and are seeking prophets and teachers who tell them things that are pleasant to their ears. Prophets that stand in the counsel of God will cause people to hear his word and turn from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. So, Apostle, what I wanted to do, if you're okay with it, we're going to jump right to Deuteronomy chapter 13, 1 through 5, and then we're going to look in, in a scripture in Matthew, and I want to touch on this thing around the false prophet. So I want to make sure we get a good understanding. And uh, some of you have asked me about the Athletes Bible. I've shared it with you. You can go on Amazon and pick this up. And sometimes I'm reading from King James. Sometimes I'm reading from this. Uh, but I always read from the King James first to make sure what I read following is still in alignment with what is written in King James. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. I want you to just hear what this says. It says, suppose there are prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs and miracles and the predicted signs or miracles occur. If they then say, come, let us worship other gods. God you have not known before, do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice, and cling to him. The false prophets or visionaries who try to lead you astray must be put to death, for they encourage rebellion against the Lord your God, who <coughs> redeemed you from slavery and brought you out of the land of Egypt. Since they try to lead you astray from the way of the Lord, your God command you to live, you must put them to death. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you. So apostle, I'm going to, we started with that and I just, I, I see you smiling. So here's the thing that I, I did, that stood out to me is that uh, when I look at Deuteronomy, he's promised it. Uh, he proclaims a sign or a wonder. And guess what? It actually comes to pass. 
So I, I guess that's one of the things. And can a false prophet tell the truth? And if they can tell the truth, what is the real danger of a false prophet? So I want to throw that out to you, Apostle, and also for our audience. If you've got questions or you you got a thought on a false prophet, put it in our chat. Go ahead, Apostle. Thank you, Deacon Preston. You know, this is the situation. This is what, what troubles me so much. In this day and time, and the, uh, the author of the lesson quotes um, something about theatrics. We find churches today, uh, they invite this prophet, a prophet is in. And they have a history. <clears throat> they have a good track record. What they say come to pass. And, and, and our people, young and old, flock to these gatherings and they have itching ears and they want to hear what this person is saying to them. Now understand, most of the time, what this person is saying has nothing to do with impeding danger. It has nothing to do with um, uh, where they need to be in order to be the blessed of the Lord. All they are talking about is your blessing. You're going to get this and you're going to get that. And, and you know, and, and many of the things that they said come to pass. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm troubled when they put a time period on it because that, that that's a danger with that. And if the Lord tell you three days, guess what? It is three days. But. The approach they use is saying, I'm going to tell you, you're gonna, it's going to come to pass. In the minds of the people, they receive that individual as a true prophet. Now, the words they spoke was true, but what makes them false is in verse 2, what you just read. After they've done all these wonderful things, then they encourage you to fo follow a false god. All right? Who they are representing is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are representing a false God. And when they do that, because they're telling you, you don't need to do this anymore. You don't need to do that. It's okay. Um, and and they, they are so exciting to people. People would give up what they know to be true and start follow, following these false teachers. Not what they said was wrong. Not the prophecy itself was wrong. Mm. And I always said that I see them to be more seers than prophets because the prophets of old told the people, as you, as you learn in Jeremiah, told the people that you got danger approaching and you're going to end up in captivity. You're going to do this. You don't hear that today. So, Apostle, I love your point. So what I'm hearing you say is that the prophecy they give can be true and can come to pass. But as people of God, we cannot get caught up in that piece. It's the next piece. If that causes me to fall astray from the Almighty. That's right. Okay. And so here's the thing I want to do because I, we, we've got that scripture in Deuteronomy. And I always want to just make sure we support what we're teaching in the word of God. So now I want to see what does Jesus say about the false prophet? So go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. And again, these aren't in our Sabbath school lesson. Um, but I wanted to just touch on what well, Deuteronomy is, but I want to just touch on some of the things that I think are really important around this piece of false prophecy. Uh, the other thing, that's why it's so important, I believe, to study God's word is that it's through the word that we actually can identify things. So go to Matthew chapter seven. I'm reading from the King James Version. And so when you think about Matthew seven, verse 15, this is Jesus actually admonishing uh, people against false prophets. So here's what Jesus says. He says, beware of false prophets. Matthew 7, beginning at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, Ye shall know them. 
And so just wanted to share that scripture as we jumped into uh, this conversation on the false prophet. Then we're going to look at the comparison of the false prophet to a true prophet. So I want to stop there before we jump into our conversation around Jeremiah. Any questions from our Facebook audience or from our Zoom class that you want to make sure we clarify on this piece around false prophets? All right. If, if not, what we want to do, I want to continue to jump in here and, and we'll look at some of the things here in our Sabbath school lesson. I want to spend time just learning about Jeremiah. So we've looked at the false prophet, and now I want to just look at Jeremiah. So when we think of Jeremiah, and so I want to just share this as we continue to study. If you saw the message notes, there, this is in there, but I want to just share with you uh, Jeremiah and who he was. So the, he, was the, he was the son of a priest from a small town in Anath, Anatoth in uh, Judah. He dictated prophecies from the Lord to his secretary, Baruch. So he would dictate them. He had this secretary or really a scribe that wrote them down. Because of his lineage, Jeremiah, he would have been raised a priest, uh, though no record of his priestly service exists. Instead, God chose this man of undeniable courage to speak the word to the people of Judah on the Lord's behalf. And here's the thing. He spoke to a people that just would not listen. Uh, Jeremiah was nearly 20 years old when he began to prophesy, and he continued in that office for the rest of his adult life, some 40 years or more. Because his message held little weight with the people, Jeremiah's prophecies reveal a substantial amount of emotional depth, often sorrow over the plight of God's people and his own troubles. Jeremiah found himself addressing a nation hurling headlong towards the judgment of God. The Israelites may have feared the future as the outside powers drew near, but rather than respond with humility and repentance, the people of Judah primarily lived as islands unto themselves, disregarding the, the Lord's commandments and increasing danger that resulted from their disobedience. So I want to just give you a preview of who Jeremiah was. Jeremiah was a prophet that prophesied to a people who refused to listen. So look at this. For 40 years, imagine doing something for 40 years and people don't respond. And there are times when you look at the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is just like, I can't do it anymore. I can't keep doing this to a people who won't listen. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 19. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 19. We're going to go through verses 1 through 15. And so if you're looking at Jeremiah, if you just, it, right after the book of Isaiah, you'll find Jeremiah. Uh, and, and if you've gone to Lamentations, you've gone too far. So right between Isaiah and Lamentations, you will find the book of Jeremiah. So we're going to spend a um, considerable amount of time going through the book of Jeremiah and looking at some of these things that are in Jeremiah. So Jeremiah 19, verses 1 through 15. So what I want you to do as you're listening to me read, I want you to think that you're the audience hearing Jeremiah prophesy that you're one of the nation of Israel in this country and you're hearing him prophesy and you watch him with this prophecy, how would you respond? So that's the question I'm going to ask you to be prepared to answer back to me. How would you respond if you were the audience hearing this prophecy from Jeremiah? So Jeremiah chapter 19, beginning at verse one. Thus saith the Lord, go and get a potter's earthen bottle and take of the ancients of the people and of the ancients of the priests and go forth into the valley of the son of Hinnon, which is by the entry of the east gate and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee and say, hear ye the words of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring evil upon this place that which whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods 
whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnon, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hands of them that seek their lives, and their carcasses will I give to, to be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city desolate and a hissing. Everyone that passeth thereby shall be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause them to eat of the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And they shall eat every one of the flesh of his friend and the siege and straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. Then shall thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee and shall say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in the Tophet, in Tophet and till there be no place to bury. Thus will I do unto this place, saith the Lord, and to the inhabitants thereof, and even make this city as Tophet. And the house of Jerusalem and the house of the kings of Judah shall be defiled as the place Tophet, because of all the houses upon whose roofs they, they have burned incense unto all the host of heaven, and had poured out drink offerings unto other gods. Then came Jeremiah when Tophet, whether the Lord had sent him prophecy, and he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon the city and upon all her towns all evil that I have pronounced against it, because they have hardened their necks that they might not hear my words. So I just want to throw this out there, Apostle. I'm listening to this, and I want to ask the class, if you're hearing this prophecy, how do you feel? How would you feel if you were hearing this prophecy? Apostle, how would you Maybe Somebody not. said, uh, you got a this Ariah, fear and trembling. Okay. Someone said it yeah. would be fear and trembling. What else? What I would say is, I don't hear this today. Oh, wow. Okay. Why? And I, let me share. I don't hear it in this format. Okay. I, what I took note of, the communication prior to Jesus was in the form of prophecy. Ah, okay. When you look at throughout the scriptures, there was uh, the teaching, like we are doing now, yep. and the preaching that would be that you do. You're speaking this afternoon. The preaching that is done, um, like we do it now, did not occur much in the Old Testament. That was a New Testament format. The way that the people were communicated to uh, in the Old Testament was mostly by prophecy. Now, let me share this. You get prophecy on Monday night Bible study, Friday night Bible study, Sabbath school, Sabbath afternoon. Uh -huh. You have, in, in our congregation, you have four times during the week to get prophecy. Uh -huh. You okay. miss it. And I have said it, I won't say everybody, but many people miss it because they're looking at the format. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the format of the prophet's of old and, and how they were used, there were not a very little teaching and a very little preaching took place in the way we know it today. The word came through prophecies. Okay. 
And they would say, what? Thus saith the Lord. The Lord is speaking. Guess what? The Lord is speaking right now. But it goes over most people's head. Yeah, Apostle, I love that. And I'm seeing some things in the chat, and I appreciate the engagement. Um, we heard fear and trembling today. St. Lisa says, at first I was okay, but then he started talking about eating my children. And I was like, really? Okay. So I want to I want to just talk but, to that a little bit. Because what had happened was the children of Israel had actually picked up a practice that the the uh that some other nations who worshiped the god Baal or God Moloch, they would actually sacrifice their children. That's and so right. what happened is to be a, you have God's people pick up a pagan practice and God says, I can't, I, it, that never has been in my mind, but you picked it up. But then when Nebuchadnezzar seizes Jerusalem and seizes this country, what ends up happening is they, because they can't go out and get food, they actually eat each other's flesh. And so it's an interesting thing. And you're right, St. Lisa, is th this right here is, it, it's harsh. And then St. Joy says, it doesn't even sound real. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that this is a true prophet that is given a true prophecy. And you have a people that are saying, there's no way that can come to pass. Go ahead, Apostle. I see you want to say something. Yeah, I was I was just thinking about, you know, this the acts that they were doing. The thing is, the same thing occurs today. People go out and they listen to people that are not grounded in truth. And they gradually introduce you to false, to strange customs. Mm. Israel did not eat their children or not, or not give their children for sacrifice. That was never part of God's ordinance for Israel. But when you start hanging with, with people that are false teachers, you start picking up on their customs. This was a, those that, that uh, sacrificed unto Baal. See, God gave Israel sacrifice of animals. That's right. Blood sacrifices for animals. He never asked. Um, the only time you're going to see a sacrifice uh, requested of God for an uh, individual was Abraham and Isaac. But God already knew that he would provide a way of escape. So I'm, I'm, I see this, and Sister Leah brings up a great question, and this may be one we have to do as a Bible study, is I wonder what are some of the pagan practices that people of God have picked up today. And so, Sister Leah, I love that question. And, and so maybe one of the things, especially as we prepare for the Passover, uh, there, there are some things that uh, when we think about people who celebrate different holidays, when you look at the origins of those holidays, they all have pagan origins. And so maybe this is one apostle that we can have conversation about as we prepare for the Passover, because you're right. What happens is, and when we think about the history, it's really interesting when Constantine became the emperor, what he was really trying to do was create political dynasty and bring people in. And, and while he, he said he was a quote unquote Christian, he allowed them to bring in a lot of pagan ways that were blended into what we would so call so-called Christianity today. So most people don't even realize that they picked up pagan practices in their worship today. So Apostle, you want to say something, and then we've got some other comments here. Yes, sir. The thing I want to touch on, and you, you already hit it, most pagan practices today are, are in centered around holidays. Mm. And, and, you know, that's when you, when you start looking at holidays, you're talking about uh, Easter coming up. Mm -hmm. And the, the god of, of fertility, you know, Esther, and they're talking about, and they offer the, the, the eggs and, and the bunny and all. There ain't no eggs and bunny in the scripture, but these are pagan customs. And I just leave it right there. You're talking about um, later. I just will give that as an example. So many pagan customs are uh, uh, embedded in our holidays. Yeah, and Apostle, I'm glad you said that. And I want to look at some of the other points that uh, uh, St. Jackie said. They were terrible. They went against God's laws, and it caused damnation to themselves. And I think that is so important. You have a nation that God has chosen, that they're supposed to be an example. And rather than being satisfied with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they go after other gods. And, and the admonition I would say for us is, as we examine our lives, 
Are we going after other gods? Are we not satisfied with what God has given us? That Are we going to other places looking for something God says, I already gave you the best. I've already given you, I've given you everything you need, but you're not satisfied with it. I think that's a dangerous place for us to be. And, and again, remember the, what I said earlier as we started. It's not that they sprinted away from God. This was actually a slow pull away and the danger about drifting away from God, you can drift and not realize you're drifting until you look up and say, my goodness, look how far away I am. So interesting comment there. Thank you for that, Sister Jackie. And then we had another comment. Interesting that people are anxious to carry out instructions by false prophets when they are bizarre, but won't do what God says do when it's simple. Thinking about naming the leper. So I love that. That again, God is asking us, and anything God asks us to do, he, uh, he's empowered us to do it. And so I think I want us to be mindful of that. So love your engagement. So Apostle, before we jump into our next scripture in Jeremiah, so we want to spend time here. Jeremiah gives this prophecy. It is a harsh prophecy. And then we actually see in verse, in chapter 20, where another prophet is basically like, uh uh, you can't prophesy that way because it's not good news. But anything you want to share before we jump into Jeremiah 20? And I, I don't want to because the, the next, what you're getting ready to get into, really speaks to what we hear today. Okay. And so, what I want to do, I'm going to read Jeremiah 20, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 20, and I'll probably read down to uh, verse 9 or 10. And so, if you've got your Bibles, I just want you to follow along. And, and I, I, I titled this, this is the price of being a true prophet, the price of being a true prophet. Now, we, we read the prophecy in, in chapter 19. Now we're going into chapter 20. And here we go. Now, for sure, the son of Emmer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then for sure, smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And it came to pass on the morrow that for sure brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, the Lord have not called thy name for sure, but Magar Misabib. For thus said the Lord, behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thy eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious, precious things therefore, and all the treasures of the king of Judah, will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them and take them and carry them to Babylon. And thou for sure and all that dwell in thy house shall go into captivity and thou shalt come to Babylon and, there shall, and thou there shall die and shall be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. O Lord, thou hast deceived me and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and has prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary for forbearing, and I could say, and I could not stay. So, Apostle, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, especially with Jeremiah saying it's like fire shut up in his bones. But I want to think about this part. Jeremiah prophet, so for sure hears him, and he actually hits the prophet. The word said it smote him, and really in our terms today, he puts him in jail. And he puts the prophet in jail. And then Jeremiah doesn't come out and say, okay, I'm going to change my prophecy. He actually comes out and says, for sure, guess what? Your name doesn't even, here's what your name means. You're going to die. Your family's going to die. This is what's going to happen. So apostle, again, 
this thing about being a true prophet as we think about today um how do we continue in the body of christ especially when we hear these prosperity gospels that everything's positive everything's great how do we continue to just stand flat-footed and preach the word of god and call sin sin that's that's what jeremiah did but he got put in jail but see, the thing is, when you start doing this, you have to, before you enter into this walk, before you enter into ministry, count the cost. Mm. Yes, you're called. First, you have to be called into it. But you have to recognize that uh, the anniversaries, the celebration, the pomp and circumstance is just a small, small percentage of, of what happens in the life of a minister. Now, here you find uh, the, the man of God, Jeremiah. Right. And he's spoken a word of prophecy unto the people. Exactly what God says. But take note of who the, uh, who the other man was with Pasha. Uh, get who he was. He was a priest, a son of a priest. Right. He knew all these things. But he decided that what Jeremiah said wasn't right and it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. The thing is, in, in ministry and in prophecy, when God speak. There are always going to be somebody telling people that you're wrong, that, that that's not going to happen. The, God don't mean it that way. God didn't mean that. He didn't mean this, that, or the other. That's part of the, the life of the ministry that make me wonder why people want to go into it. Mm, amen. So I want, I want to capture this. Uh, uh, Sister Myra says, for sure, should have minded his business. And that is so true. Um, and then Brother Vic gives us uh, a... Um, Maga Misabib, terror on every side. And that's actually what that means. But here's yeah. the thing I, I want to ask to the Sabbath school class. When we think about it, it's easy for us to play Monday morning quarterback and look at hindsight and say, man, look at the children of Israel. But my question is, uh, Apostle, why, why do you believe people don't want to hear about their sins? And as we're looking at what's happening with Jeremiah, are there sins in our life we need to confront? Because what the prophet is really doing is he's delivering a message, but he's also saying, I, it, when I look at all the prophets in the Old Testament, they were bringing forth a message around, you need to stop sinning. God is giving you an opportunity. Now, in Jeremiah, he was saying, it's over. This is going to be the judgment of God. But the question I would have for all of us is, is there an area in our life that the word of God is uncovering that I need to get right? Because it's easy, again, like I said, it's easy for us to look at them. But then I would ask the question, Apostle, why do you believe people, and I'm including us, all of us in this, why don't we want to hear about our sins? Well, the reason is we want to think that we all that. We want to think that I'm better than somebody else. Well, yeah, I got some things going on in my life, but I'm not as bad as the one over there. And people even speak that off the time to, as if it was some sense of justification. You know what? There is a word of prophecy that we are given today, and this is it. Mm. This right. is the word of prophecy. Yeah, and I don't have to have some minister to come tell me. And, uh, you know, we talk about reading God's word every day. When you read this, you're getting a word of prophecy. And that word of prophecy that you're getting is going to speak to sin. It's going to let you know what God, what God requires, let you know that your own thoughts um, is not going to be his thoughts. Your way is not going to be his way. But to, for, in order to make it, in order to be in God's good graces, we're going to have to line up with the word of God, which is the word of prophecy. Amen. So I think about this. In the word of God, we've got a hiding place. And I see Sister Darlene says, people like darkness more than they like light. And St. Jackie shared, God's word is a mirror that shows us ourselves. And that's, so, that's why it's so important for us to uh, get into God's word. It, it's so critical that we spend time studying God's word and say, Ross, said, it goes back to that lesson on rebuke. Amen. To love me is to rebuke me when I'm in the wrong, to snatch me off the path of destruction. Now, I love that tie in because that lesson on rebuke, uh, when we run into whether we see it as rebuke, whether we see it as constructive criticism, whether we see it as feedback, when you have someone that can tell you the truth and tell you the truth in love, and I love what you said here to snatch me off the path of destruction. 
that's what that's the that's the beauty of the word of God. So appreciate that context and and giving us some insight there. So I want to just get back into this lesson around Jeremiah. Question. No, no go ahead. We got a question. I, I just was going to answer your question. So I um I believe that's uh, sometimes the case that you know people are just kind of full of themselves. But I think on the other hand, sometimes we don't. We don't want the negativity uh, or feeling bad about ourselves. You know, uh, I believe I believe a lot of people really intend on doing right. I'll say myself, you know, um, uh, there, there's a scripture uh, that's been ringing with me. And it made me kind of recollect on some other events. Mm -hmm. And it, it showed me that I was, wasn't in line with the will of God. And it made me feel bad because my desire is to be in his will. Right. So sometimes people just don't want to find out that they're not doing things exactly like they wish or should or could. So it's a little unsettling, you know, um, and I, I think that might be the case with some people. All right, so Minister Rashad, I love that point. So what, what I heard you say is people have a fear. Is that what, is that what I'm hearing? I don't, I don't know if it, if I would classify it as fear, it's just almost like uh, working on a test, studying for a test. You take that test and you get a bad grade. And the feeling, you know, and, and to, the feeling you feel for all your hard work to find out that you were on the wrong path. You know, think, think about it like this. Think of uh, maybe someone that's been going to church on a Thursday all their life. And okay. God reveals the Sabbath to them. And they're like, man, I thought I had it. Right. You know, just just an example. So yeah. I hope that clarifies it for you. I love that. When you said that, that made me think about the song 99 and a half won't do. <laughs> we, yes, sir. We got to get to 100. So I love that point. Uh, St. Rob brings up another point. We don't want prophecy that urges us to stop doing what is pleasing to our flesh. We want to continue in sin, but without the condemnation. Wow. All right. So, Apostle, I see you want to say something on that one. Is yeah, because, the, you know, that point. okay, I, when I'm looking at this and I'm, my mind is going back to those people who go from city to city. Now, before the pandemic, they got a, uh, yeah, thank you. Before the pandemic, they got a, um, a schedule. And some are trying to work their schedule now. This is their livelihood. Mm -hmm. And the livelihood said that I'm going to be in um, Columbus, Ohio tonight. Tomorrow night, I'm going to be in Dallas, Texas. I'm going to be in L.A. I'm going to hit these cities, and I'm going from city to city with a word of prophecy. People are going to come from miles around. They're going to pack out a 10,000-seat facility. And just to get a word, they're going to make them feel good. But when you walk away, and the, and the lesson told us earlier, because this is filthy lucre. Now, listen, the scripture says your gift will make room for you. But the problem I'm having with prophecy is that many times they want to prostitute or, or make merchandise out of the gift that God has given them. And that was never God's intent for prophecy. And never will they prophesy, as, as uh, Sister Ryan said, they're not going to prophesy about things that are going to I'm not saying they never, but very rarely will they prophesy about things that are going to condemn somebody. And most of the time, when there's a prophecy of condemnation, and you watch the other folks in the congregation, they're rejoicing because somebody's being condemned. They don't, very rarely they come in and condemn the whole city, mm -hmm. condemn the whole congregation, because you ain't coming back no more. No more money for you. All right. So I want to get back to some of these points. And it, so this is not actually Sister Rye, I think it's, and I, hopefully I won't mess up the name, St. Timony. And, and if I mess that up, please forgive me. She's been bringing up some, some really good points. And uh, Minister Rashawn said, schedulized, generalized, pro scheduled, generalized prophecies. And so I want to get back to this point about we may want to continue in sin because it connects to our lesson last night. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because apostle, you touched on that last night around grace. And so I want us to be very mindful of that is that really the, the, the purpose of the prophet 
was it to either point out sin, it would either let you know of an impending judgment, but most of the prophets, and even Jeremiah, when you look at Lamentations, he still is saying, even when God punishes you, he's still going to give you hope. He's still going to give you an opportunity. And so I want you to walk away as we look at this lesson of speak my word faithfully, that even if you're in sin, we want to make sure we hear the word of God because his desire is that no one would perish. And that's what he was giving Jeremiah in uh, just saying, okay, we say it all the time in Jeremiah 29 and 11. I think, Apostle, you brought that up. We always talk about that as some good thing. But what Jeremiah was really saying is that's going to be while you're 70 years in Babylon. So get married, have children. And guess what? I do know the thoughts that God has towards you and all these things, but you're still going to be in bond. You're still going to be in cap captivity. That's right. That's right. All right. So let's look at some of the other points we've got here. When we're convicted by the Lord, it may feel hurtful. But ultimately, it's a blessing because he disciplines those whom he loves. St. Leah, I love that point. So that reminds me of the scripture in Hebrews where he says, I chasten whom I love. And while that chastement may hurt in the moment, it brings about the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So I think that's really important for us to make sure we get. All right. Love the engagement. We're going to look at one or two more scriptures. So let's go over the second Timothy chapter four. I just want us to be mindful as we look at God's word, 2 Second, Second Timothy chapter 4. And as we look at this, I want us to hear, and now think about this as far as this lesson is concerned. As I think about hearing God's word, as I study God's word, am I looking at things, and I think, Minister Rashawn, you said it, that there was a scripture that's been resonating with you all week, but the scripture was really bringing light to some things for you and just saying, okay, I'm not where I need to be. That's the beauty of the scripture. Someone said something last night that really stuck with me on our topic of grace. Um, and they said it in a way, they said, you know what? Um, we think God, as he extends grace, we can, we can think about grace as this really this past for sin. And what it really is showing is we may not have a heart for God, and it causes us to be in this state where I think I can sin and God's going to be okay with it. That's a dangerous place to be. That I can think I can stay in sin, run back and get grace, and run back out and sin again. So Hoover said that last night. I thought it was such a good point and one that we need to be mindful of. So 2 Timothy chapter 4. Apostle, anything you want to add before we jump into this next I'll say, yeah, Go right ahead. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. And this is Paul writing to his young apprentice, uh, uh, Timothy. He says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, doctrine but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of their ministry. So apostles, I look at this scripture. This is one that we, uh, we know and look at, but I want to ask this question to you in the Sabbath school. What is sound doctrine? Excellent question, Dick Compressor. Sound doctrine is simply the word of God. Okay. And, and not only the word, because this is the thing. You can go to any church today, tomorrow. Everybody is going to read, for the most part, from the same uh, series of, of, of Bibles, a different version of it, but the same foundation of Bible, right? Mm -hmm. What makes it sound? It's not just the spoken word, the written word that makes it sound, it's the right interpretation of it that makes it sound. Because the same scripture I use uh, to say this is what we should do, somebody else using the same scripture and actually condemning uh, what I said. That's why as, as, as preachers and teachers, when somebody bring you a scripture and say that they are um, they're teaching this or, uh, or this is their position, don't go get another scripture. 
the scripture, come let us what? Reason together. Let us look at the same scripture and make sure we get the right intent of the scripture. If we get the right intent of the scripture, we go walk away with sound doctrine. Mm. So sound doctrine is the word of God. So that, that's how, and so I, if you're making notes, I want us to be mindful of that. So you're saying sound doctrine is the word of God. And so as yes. we look at this, as Paul, write, as Paul writes to Timothy, he said there will come a time where they, won't, they don't want sound doctrine. And so I want, to just, I want us to really think through this. How can it be that if I, if I want to be in relationship with God, that I do not want sound doctrine? Because I don't want the truth of the word. I want to take the word and my private. That's why I'm all but my prayer and my teaching is what? Lord, don't let me have a private interpretation. Because if I come to a private interpretation or an accepted interpretation, then I'm not teaching sound doctrine. That's why every once in a while, the Lord allows to bring up something that is it's one of those wild moments. We've heard it a certain way all of our lives in the house of God and any other place. We've heard it a certain way. But God is saying, you know what? Y'all been playing with this thing for a long time. Let me, the Lord, give you the right interpretation. And it just opened up a whole new um, understanding. And it gives us one of those wild moments. Yes, I've said it. Yes, I've quoted it. And I quoted it for one intent, just from reading the word and my understanding of the word. But then the Lord said, Step back. Let me give you what the intent, the true intent of the word is. And that's what makes a sound. Amen. I love that, Apostle. And as I look at some of the comments that are there, uh, Brother Victor brings up one of the things I think we touched on last week is broad is the way that leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. And many will walk therein because it allows you not to be obedient. So, Brother Victor, love that point that you bring up. And then Brother Minister Rashad says, People want the feeling and benefits without the commitment. That's right. All right. So uh, I want the feeling and the benefits without the commitment. Man, somebody's going to have to preach that one Sabbath. So, uh, so let's think about this. I'm interested in it, but I don't want to be committed to it because there's just two different things is that I'm interested versus committed. So, Rashad, I'm going to ask you to come off mute because you got to really give us some clarity on that because you said, and then Sister Myra said, counterfeit holiness. <laughs> y'all getting, getting deep in here. So let's just go that. I want the feeling. I want the benefit. But you're saying I don't want the commitment. So the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, a common uh, scenario in relationships. You know, they want the girlfriend, they want the side piece, they want all some of those things that come with marriage, but they don't want that commitment. They don't want to have to put it on the health plan and they don't want to have to, you know, split their income and just all those other things, commit to raising children with the person. Maybe if that person already has kids, take on their kids, the stepkids, all the, all the commitment part. They want the benefits, you know, the shoulder piece, you know, taking her out to dinner and she's fine, all, all those things. And that's the same thing we do with God. You know, we want to, we want the blessings from God. We want to reap, but we don't necessarily want to sow. You know, we, we, <laughs> uh, what came to my mind, and I don't know if it's because I'm on, on the finance team, but we want to put the dollar in the offering, but we want God to send us a mysterious thousand dollar check. You know, uh, as far as a lifestyle, we want to we want to say we're a Christian and we believe in him and we appreciate him, but we don't want to live a lifestyle that is lined up in the doctrine, the word of God, you know, the living a sin free life, not fornicating, not cussing people out all the time, not gossiping. Or oh, anytime. <laughs> or anytime. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, you know. There's just, there's some things and, and really the thing that I've learned and, and as I've gotten older, uh, I, I know the scripture says my, my burdens are light, but they really are. The things that God wants you to do really make your life so much better. Yeah. And it's like, why not follow him? Why, why not follow Christ? Um, and and, and la my last point, like we were talking about uh, grace last night and what stood out to me is, you know, a lot of people want the grace of God, the, the benefits, you know. Um, no, he doesn't kill us, but when we sin, he forgives us. 
He still continues to bless us, but we just don't want to dedicate ourselves to him. And it just, when you really, really think about it, it makes no sense. Right. For someone that has done so much for you and will continue to do so much for you. You know, it's just like, why would it's I cheat on this clock. woman? Like anybody that knows me knows I'm a handful. And, and, <laughs> but she has patience with me. Amen. She cares for me. She loves me. She takes care of me when I'm sick, takes care of my children. Why would I do anything to hurt her? And that's the same thing we do to God. That's my piece. And she is Jamaican. She probably got a knife. But go ahead. <laughs> machete, machete. Oh, machete, okay. <laughs> Hey, man, I, is that Sister Charmaine? It is. Y'all go right ahead. All right, so I do have a question. Okay, mm -hmm. so when, when we look at the, um, the prophets of old, and then we look at the apostles' message of today, their message is Jesus saves. Mm -hmm. And so you think about why wouldn't someone want God, you know, along the same lines that Minister Rashad is saying, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't that person, or why wouldn't we want God? Is there a possibility? Um, the perception of Jesus, the way he has been presented, has caused people not to really want him? Yeah. Wow. You know, that that could be part of the right, Sister Charmaine, but I think the reason that it's not as much as that people don't want God, is they don't want to be committed. You see what I'm saying? Um, the the prophets of old, and, and you know, the main prophecy, the, the ongoing prophecy of old was Jesus coming. Christ is going to come. He's going to send the Savior. You go back to Isaiah, right? He's talking about he's going to send a Redeemer. He's going to send the Savior. And then that's why some people say today that, that there are no more prophets um, uh, after Jesus came. No, those prophets that of the Old Testament other than dealing with people in their immediate sins and conditions, the ongoing prophecy was the coming of the Messiah, right? Since Jesus has come, the ongoing prophecy now is what? The return of the Messiah. There's no more prophecies talking about the coming of the Messiah because he's already come. But then the prophet today is saying that, hey, get it right because the Savior is going to make his return. Now back to what you were saying, Sister Charmaine, is that most people profess to have even having Christ in their lives, but they don't want to commit to all that. What um, Mr. Rashad was talking about, they don't want to commit to that whole aspect of I got to be truly in Christ in order to be ready for his return. Yeah, I, I love that question, St. Charmaine, because I think it's really interesting, especially as we look at the world today. Um, and I just believe that the church in, in a moment, and I say the, when I say the church, the body of Christ, I think the last few years have been detrimental to the body of Christ from a standpoint of how we have responded to some issues. And I think it's so important that we understand, I think the greatest gift we can model to anyone uh, around Jesus Christ is the love of Christ. And I think that's so important. I think a lot of times we may miss that as the church. And why, why again, when you look at research, and I think Deacon Ragland is doing uh, this thing as Jesus left the church. Uh, but I think the question now becomes, when we look at 17 to 25-year-olds are leaving the church in droves, and I think the data is showing us a lot of things. And one of the things is saying, it seems that the church is hypocritical. It seems that the church is uh, not really following the gospel itself. And so I think that point you bring up is such a great point. I think it's something we have to continue to really think about, even how we model Jesus Christ. So we got some other points I want to get before we close up Sabbath school. Uh, the, the comment was church as an emotional experience rather than a transformative one. Feeling good doing service, usually because of the music, but leading with an unchanged mind. I think that's such a powerful point that we have to be mindful of. Is my mind changed? Go to Romans chapter 12. What does Paul actually encourage the church? He wants us to be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. Uh, Minister Rashawn, and I'm gonna, I'm about to start coining some of his phrases. People want degrees, but they don't want to go to school. They want income, but they don't want to work. They want sex, but they don't want to get married. And the list could go on and on. 
we must be we must be inconsistency and not we must be I'm assuming consistent and not only Sabbath or Sunday only Christian. So we've got to model that consistency. Appreciate that, St. Joyce. Get the baby without the labor pains. All right, Sister Myra, I'm going to read this one. Haven't had a baby, but I'm sure any woman would opt for that as well. But the hardship seems to bring more appreciation when we get on the other side of the trial, testing, growing. We all so much remember we can slip into giving ear to unassuming false prophets. Two, zodiac signs. One can find parallels sometimes to their personality, but any knowledge that is imparted outside of the Almighty is false because anything outside of God is illegal. And so the church has conformed to the world to gain numbers. Whew, man, y'all are hitting it hard today. All right, last question, Satan. And I love the point y'all are bringing up. Is God calling everyone? Is God calling everyone? Is everyone being drawn? No nope and no. But let me go back to uh, Sister Myra's point okay. about getting the baby without the pain. They want the epidural. <laughs> okay. You know, give me something. Give me something that's going to reduce what I have to do. Give me something that uh, I'm going to get the end results or that I think I'm going to get the end results only to find out that I'm not. Mm. Why? Because um, uh, these, these things and these other ways of, of accomplishing something may work in life. Okay, having a baby without the pain, you know, but if by taking an epidural or whatever else, um, going and and I'm not saying this. For, well, I'm gonna go that one, but but that's the, but the point I'm making is that in life, in our natural lives, we can accomplish our desires. Um, Mr. Rashad, getting the degree. Look, I can just go online today and order me a doctorate. Amen. It looks official, got the gold leaves and everything around it. Now I can present it to anybody. You know, I had a buddy of mine looking for a job and the job required a, um, a degree. He went online and found out a school that had closed for three years ago. And he said he got a degree from that school. Hey, we can do all kinds of creative stuff, but that creative stuff will not work when it comes down to what Christ requires. Apostle, just real quick, um, and I'm not saying this as an advocate, you know, against our, uh, epidural, but uh, they tell you when you're uh, having a baby and all that stuff. Uh, I haven't had one, but we've got three. My wife had three. Uh, I, back, I actually delivered, delivered one of our children. Oh, uh, wow. With the assistance of the doctor. But when you don't do the epidural, you actually heal and recover Fast. faster. That's and right. Actually, minimize your risk when you don't use the epidural. So, so my wife was always against going natural. Uh, our last baby, she went natural by accident. <laughs> she said she will probably do it again after having two kids with an epidural. So, so it, it goes back to what Sister Myra said about when you the, appreciating the hardships. Uh, so, I, I just wanted to touch on that. You you know what's funny, Minister Rashawn, is that whenever men talk about the pain of their wives' labor, Jessica's face is saying it all because she's like, "You didn't deliver any of them." That's why I had to give a disclaimer. I had to give a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So we we want to get back to the point because I want to make sure we get that question from our Minister Allen. She said, "I asked the question because John informs us that we must be drawn by the Lord. So there are people that can't do right." So she's asking the question. So there are people that that's not going to do right. Yeah. Okay. So we're so you're saying there are people who just they can't do right. Because if they listen, and this is one of the hardest things that we have to deal with uh in, in the body of Christ or at dealing with people. There are some people that is just not going to make it, they're not chosen. And I know that sounds harsh, but I believe this. I believe even with that with that statement and, and that verse, that if you desire to have Christ, he will make himself available. So I, that desire, if I, have, if I have a desire, you're saying he will make himself available to me. But we have to also understand, back to her question, her point, the desire has to be, be put in you by God. Amen. 
I, I want to read that scripture that, that was put in there uh, by uh, Minister Esther. She said it's St. John chapter 44, chapter 6, verse 44. And I want to read verse 43 and 44. And it says, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among your, amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So that's the scripture that she put in the chat, and I wanted to read that scripture. And so here's the thing. I just always appreciate the level of engagement in our Sabbath school. And so our challenge, and I think about this as we, as we leave Sabbath school and we think about the application. Uh, the sound doctrine is the word of God. The danger of the false prophet is the false prophet can speak truth. A false prophet can say something that's true, but the danger of the false prophet is the false prophet's intent is to draw me away from God. So remember the scripture we read in Deuteronomy, what that prophet said came to pass, but the, the danger was, are they going to draw you away from God? And when you think about God's response, God's response to the false prophet was, you, you got to take a false prophet out because they create a spirit of rebellion. And then we look at the prophet Jeremiah who prophesied <laughs> some things that were hard, but it was, it was hard because the children of Israel had been a, in a consistent state of disobedience. They had been in a consistent state of rebellion. And this is the thing we sometimes don't want to hear and don't hear in the church is that there will come a time where God will punish us. There will come a time where he will discipline us and that discipline. So think about the, the definition I give of love at the beginning of every Sabbath school. One of the things is his selective correction. The discipline of God actually shows the love of God because he loves us enough to actually discipline us. And so then we go to Timothy where we hear about sound doctrine. Now I would say this as we close up Sabbath school, how do you apply this lesson to your life? Is there any sin? And it doesn't even have to be sin. I think the scripture talks about any weight or sin that easily besets us. So you could be carrying a weight that you that God wants you to be delivered from. You could be dealing with a sin that God wants you be, to be delivered from. And those things can be remedied by applying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to share that today as we wrap up this Sabbath school lesson. Speak my word faithfully is that as we hear the word of God, let us apply the word of God to our life that it may change us. And so, Apostle, before I turn it over to St. Charmaine, I know she'll turn it back over to you. I appreciate your level of engagement. Y'all are making Sabbath school better and better. Remember, in 2021, our ask is for you to do what? Bring one. Bring one. 2021, bring one. And I want to, you know, here's my thing. I want you to let us know. When you bring somebody, let us know so we can recognize you and thank you for doing that. This is a time I believe we can all grow and grow together. So thank you for your continued engagement. It's getting better and better every Sabbath, and that's because of your engagement, your participation. So with that, I'm going to put this into the hands of our uh, – is that St. Minnie? She wants to say something? Yes, please. All right, St. Minnie, there you go. I want to – Ask your question. You said that about the false prophet will bring truth. He doesn't bring all truth, does he? He brings, he makes the truth with lies, doesn't he? Not necessarily. No? Not, not every time. But the, that, but the same minute, the truth that, the lie that he mixes with. Yes. Is the, when, he, when he encourages you. Is deception? Well, no. When he encourages you to follow another God. That's the lie. The lie when he could he could a false prophet could speak to you today about something on your mind, something you're gonna be faced with, something that you're going to encounter, and everything that false prophet tells you is true. But after that, if he said, Oh, sister Minnie, you don't have to keep the Sabbath, you don't need to do this, you don't need to do come go with me. Um, we don't go through all of that. You know, life will be much easier for you if you follow me. That's what makes him false. And that's the lie that he told you. But the actual event that he may have prophesied to you about is true. Did that get your uh, answer to your question, St. Manny? Um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let, let me share this. St. Manny, like many of us, have a history of, um, you know, the word being shared with us. 
Now, there are false prophets that will tell you a truth and mix it with a lie. But I'm talking about the, I'm not talking about the uh, intent or who the person is. I'm talking about the actual word that is spoken to you of what is going to happen in your life. Um, they could tell you everything they tell you is actually true, right? But their intent and what they're trying to get you to do after that or along with that is a lie. Okay. And that, that was the first verse that we read, um, hey, many, uh, in, um, actually, that's 34. What was it? Deuteronomy wrong? 13. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy. The first scripture we read in Deuteronomy 13, and the second verse, uh, and the, well, in those first five verses, explain to us, they may teach you and tell you, I, I see this, I dream this, all of it, and it'd be right. But when they tell you, come, let's go and follow another God, that's what make it false. All righty. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, doll. Thank you, Saint Mary. So here's the thing. I love that type of engagement and those yes. questions. That's really important. And remember, Sabbath school is for us to get an understanding. So here's the other thing I would say. If you've got questions as you study throughout the week, and you're just like, I want to get a good understanding of this in Sabbath school. Our St. Brenda, her emails out there when she sends out just our, the message notes or information on Sabbath school. If you've got a question you want to make sure myself or Apostle addresses in Sabbath school, send that to us in advance. And, there, and here's what I always say. I'm a teacher, but I don't know everything. And so there may be times where we say, hey, we just don't know. We, we will go back and research that for you because, again, we want to make sure that we address questions because we want to leave Sabbath school applying the word of God to our lives. So with that, I'm going to put it into the hands of our Sabbath school superintendent, our St. Charmaine. God bless you, Sister Charmaine. Amen. Um, I see Sister Lauren's hand is up. Yeah. Is your question? Yes, I just want to address on the everyday life application. Did the role or definition of the prophet change in the New Testament church? And if the answer is yes, then how so? I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Um, the prophets of the old was the one that taught the word of God. They, they, that was the individual that uh, heard from God and, and gave the people what thus saith the Lord. See, because they didn't have this. They didn't have the, the recording of the word. Now they they wrote it. They wrote it up in, scro in, in, in scrolls, but it wasn't given to everybody. Those scrolls were not were not published and passed around. Those scrolls were, were kept with the priesthood. So it was up to the priests to let the people know. Today, um, the word of prophecy is again simply the mostly the written word of God. And anybody bring you anything other than what is written in this book, that's a lying prophet. And and, the, and, like I, and I said earlier, I believe that the prophets of today are the ones that are teaching and preaching God's word. Back in the Old Testament, they were not teaching and preaching the word of God as it is today. So that's the difference. Um, it might be a play on words, but prophets... And then we look in um, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, we talk about the, the gifts in the church and prophecy and yet teaching and, uh, and ministering. All these things are in there. It didn't discredit prophecy, but it lets you know that there are other gifts that are working in the church. Okay. Uh, Apostle, okay. Um, on last night, um, Apostle, you said... Okay, so when we look at Jeremiah 31 and 31, he says that he, that the Lord is going to put, um, he's going to write a new covenant. Right. And so when I ran reference on that scripture, it takes me to Luke 22, uh, where it talks about the New Testament, his blood, Jesus becoming our high priest. Yeah. Um, and it's through the spirit of God that now uh, we have the ability to live right. And that new covenant, now is written on our hearts. But you said last night, you brought faith in. Yeah. Can you, can you expound on that a little bit more? First of all, you know, and thank you for that. But, but the, the, what I was saying is that, because I was tying it into grace, we have a covenant. The old covenant was a covenant of the commandments only. 
right? The new covenant is a co is a covenant of grace that doesn't discard the commandment because we need the commandment because without that, we don't know what truth is, all right? But the way we are, the way it works today is my love for Christ. I love him. I received him. I received his spirit. And through his spirit, that, that faith in, in Christ lets grace work in my life that as I'm doing things outside of God's will, it's bringing me knowledge and giving me an opportunity to get there, to do it. All right, then. So we do thank the Lord for Sabbath school. We praise God that each time that he allows us to come in, that he certainly visit us uh, with his spirit. And what happens is we walk away with a better understanding of him. Um, you know how Apostle Paul said, the spirit of God just don't come to make you dance. Well, guess what? The presence of God is in our lesson, helping us to understand him and learn of him. And so we appreciate that. We thank God for that. We even thank God that he lets us know through the prophets and uh, through the prophet of Jeremiah, the warning of the people and the lessons that we're learning from the instructions of the scripture. Um, and thank God that we, he, that he gives us the ability to hear his words so we can get right. So we can get right because we have an opportunity to be saved and to have eternal life through him. So thank you for tuning in. And again, I trust that you were blessed in the Sabbath school this morning. And if there are no more questions or comments, we're going to close it out and turn it into the hands of Apostle Ray. Um, this is Brother Jones. I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the question just pertains to what about people that is um, new into Christ or babes of Christ, young babes and stuff like that? How do they look out for false prophets and what they need to be listed to when somebody's speaking? Because ask, the ask a question. Huh? Ask a question, Brother Jones. Yeah. That's why everybody needs a covering. That young babe in Christ, that person that just come to Christ, if you're the one that introduced them to Christ, you need to stay with them. I talked to a young man yesterday uh, uh -huh. that he, i give an example. He had this individual new to Christ and he's in another state. He said, I'm going to hook you up with this um, this other minister I know that used to be, this is another org, a church organization, was our national um, youth president, and, and you know, he is, now he's pastoring, so they call him, and he said, oh, we have this men's Bible um, discussion, um, and it was nationally, you know. Them brothers came on there, and that, that young man was so discouraged, because they got to talking about politics and a whole lot of other things. Right. That, that yeah. this young man should have been shielded from at that place right. in his walk. So I told the young man, but telling me, I said, you need to go back and let him know, apologize for what he heard. Not that it was wrong or anything, but apologize for what he heard because he wasn't ready. And now you walked him through to get him to that point that he needs to be. And, and we have to understand. Um, Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Sister Ronda. There was Sister Ronda just gave me a, a note. Don't forget, now, next week is the um, National Women's Conference. We won't have an adult Sabbath school, but we will have the youth Sabbath school. And uh, and I'm going to let, after I make this statement, I'm going to let Sister Charmaine come back and maybe explain to you more about the youth, the youth Sabbath school on next week. I think we may have other people in, uh, joining with us. Uh, so, but, but I want you to understand that we need to, an uh, individual, Brother Jones, that's new to Christ, you stay with them and you take them to leadership that they can be under covering. So as they hear things, they need to be comfortable with, look, I heard this. Is it right? Is it wrong? Show me in the scriptures. Until they become strong, right? They, right. they, 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 they strive on the milk of the word. And you the one that's, <laughs> breastfeeding them. You're the one that has to, to, to feed them the milk of the word. And as they get stronger, they'll be able to eat the meat of the word. But and then at that time, uh, they still have a covering, but they're more apt to be able to handle the things that they are, they are hearing and know how to rightly divide these things. I want to say this, and I'm giving it to, back to Charmaine. Um, 
I know you're curious about the fast. I won't say unfortunately, but the Lord has not released me to release you from the fast. So we still ask you to continue to fast in the 24 hour period. Um, do that on the coming week. We also ask you to continue to send your uh, fast scriptures to encourage yourself and others to our sister Brenda and maybe once or twice a day she sends them out. Saints, I'm really encouraging you, to, all of you to fast. Uh, ain't gonna kill you. Yeah, you might feel a little hungry, but it ain't gonna kill you. Now, also let me, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna leave that. Sister Sean, oh, this afternoon we will uh, be in our Black History Month program. It's gonna be um, presented by our youth department, brother. Our brother Michael is our youth president. Our Deacon Preston um, is preaching this afternoon. So uh, please come back at one o'clock. And we just got about 35 minutes, but come back at one o'clock to join us for um, our afternoon worship service. That's just Charmaine. I'm going to say I'm finished now. When you explain Sabbath school next week at you Sabbath school, then we can just, you'll be, that'd be the final word and we'll be dismissed. Okay, so the, as far as the Sabbath school for youth, it would be the same format that we, we um, we're in now, meaning um, you start logging on around 945 and we will cut off at 1045. Um, Sister Darlene will be the teacher uh, for class number one. I think it's ages two to 12. And then Digan Ronnie will be the um, teacher for class two. Um, ages 13 up to 30. And it's going to be open up to anybody in the National Church who wants to join our Sabbath school. They're going to get the information for Sabbath school and they can tune in. So encourage your, your young people to tune in because we will have Sabbath school for the youth next Sabbath.